Hey folks, Matt Kuda here. Welcome back to the podcast. Episode 83, the Sony A7R 3 my first impressions. So, when we last talked, uh, we talked about my move to Sony and all of that, what that would entail. Certainly, it has been kind of a long journey and a long process to evaluate cameras to shoot with the a7 III and then finally to decide you know what I was going to go to what my future kit will look like and so forth uh, part of that was the purchase uh, about a week or two ago a week ago I guess of the Sony a7r3 now many of you may wonder especially if you're new to Sony you know what are the differences between the Sony a7 III and the Sony a7R III? Um, I'm not going to go into that in this episode particularly because I think that deserves maybe a half an episode or an entire episode to talk about the differences there. I will say the biggest difference and the key difference is that the R stands for resolution in the a7R III and you get a 42 megapixel sensor. In the a7 III, you get a 24 megapixel sensor. But I digress. Let's move on. Um, so when I when I thought about you know what would what my new kit would look like, um, I knew that I needed a higher megapixel sensor camera in the mix. And the reason I went down the road that I went down is because um, of two reasons. One. I really wanted the higher resolution uh, so that I could use the APS-C mode and be able to still get a 17 to 18 megapixel image even crop to 1.5 crop. So that allows me to uh, get a little more reach, get a little closer to my subject. Um, and I just couldn't, uh, I just couldn't get around that, you know. So what were some of the other options I looked at there? You know, uh, could I get an A9, for example, uh, a 24 megapixel A9 and then put a teleconverter on it? And okay, that's an option. It's a little bit more expensive option, but it's an option. Uh, one of the reasons I did not go that direction was one, you're gonna lose a stop of light uh, with that setup and two, it doesn't solve my other issue, which is sometimes you just want a high resolution camera for doing things like still life, still lifes, um, large scenics, um, really anything that would require a really high megapixel output. And so this solved that need as well. So that was my second need was needing a higher megapixel camera in general. So I felt like that, that, you know, given the fact that I try to look for bargains and given the fact that um, I really couldn't afford an A9 II or, or an A1, I settled on the A7R three on the used market. And so what I did was I went out to eBay and I typically do not buy cameras on eBay. I will tell you that right now. But because I was really, really looking for a bargain here, I went out on eBay and I found a doozy. Uh, there was a camera out there, uh, $1,600, um, excellent condition, has uh, it has the box with it, all the original uh, uh, cables and like some of the cables weren't even used; they were still in the packaging. Um, it only had like 11,000 shots through it total pretty much a brand new camera and so it was kind of a no-brainer this camera originally was over three thousand dollars and I picked it up basically half price so it was made in 2017 um, so it's getting a little long in the tooth but still a very very viable camera in 2022 and I, I recommend people take a hard look at it especially if you're needing that extra resolution for whatever purposes um, if I were looking at a video camera, I don't think I would look at the a7R 3 but we can talk about that a little bit uh, later. Um, so the look and feel of the camera is very much, I've got it here in my hands, 
The look and feel of the camera is very much like the a7 III, which I purchased first. Uh, same size, a little bit heavier. Um, the a7R III has a fully magnesium construction, full magnesium construction. Uh, the a7 III does not. It has uh, the back underneath, or the back is all plastic on the a7 III. So the a7R III, all magnesium. Of course, it has that kind of rubberized coating on the outside that we see in so many cameras. Um, the front is just very nice, very, I can, I can kind of, there's some, I think there's a, maybe a plastic covering on the outside of the magnesium to, to give it, you know, a little more protection, a little less, a little more scratch proof. Um, so that's fine. Um, the sensor, uh, full frame sensor, we'll, we'll go into that in a little bit. Um. It has three modes. One of the great features of this camera compared to the a7 III is it has three modes, or three, I shouldn't say modes, but three settings where you can save your settings to. So, for example, and I'm, I'm probably going to put a whole video out on this at some point, uh, what I, how my settings are set up on this camera. But, for example, you know, number one, the number one setting can be for birds in flight, the number two, or just general wildlife, for example, number two could be, you know, kind of emergency settings for birds. For example, you know, you could have auto, uh, auto ISO set up at one two thousandths of a second. You know, all that stuff set up, ready to go in case you need to get to it quickly. And then number three could be for landscape, for example. That's just kind of how I roll. Um, of course, there's the video on it and uh, it has a C1, C2, C3, and C4 buttons as well. And, you know, I'll, I'll go into that when I do my settings uh, uh, podcast or, or video. But, I, you know, the overall construction, now I do like to have a, a Velo grip. I, bu I buy a Velo grips for these. It's the Velo BG56 grip. And I do buy those for all of these and they work very well. And that gives me the ability to use two batteries and um, gives me a much better ergonomic feel, much more like a Canon, for example, but not, but without the weight. And I will say uh, in the weight area, I was really impressed with having two bodies in my camera bag that didn't weigh a whole lot. When I took my 7D Mark II out and sold it, the weight savings was immediately noticeable. That camera, I don't know what the full weight on it was with the battery grip, but it was pretty chunky. And this one uh, really helped save weight. It really did. Um, so that's kind of the, the feel of the camera. It feels good, the look and feel, if you will. Um, it has a center uh, viewfinder, which is nice. It doesn't have the offset viewfinder as the Sony APS-C cameras do. Um, you know, well, let's just really go down through the specs now. And now that I've kind of given me my, my first impressions on the, the body itself. So the lens mount, of course, is a Sony E-mount. Um, the sensor resolution is 42.4 megapixels. What that translates to is 7,952 pixels by 500 by 5,304 pixels. Um, so again, that higher resolution camera, it's just so easy to fall in love with. Five axis uh, in-body image stabilization, just like the Sony a7 III has. Um, really like that feature. Um, and, the, and the beauty of that, if you don't know, the beauty of having IBIS inside your camera is, is so that you can use lenses that don't have IBIS. So, and, and even if it doesn't uh, communicate with your camera, you can actually manually go in and tell, tell the Sony to, hey, this is a 24 millimeter lens, please apply image stabilization, and it will. So you can even manually set that in there. Um, it has a technology called pixel shift technology. And it sounds like a really, really cool feature. And I guess depending on what your genre of photography is, 
it is a good feature. Um, how it works, and the way I like to think of this, and this is not exactly the way it works, but if you've ever taken uh, a panoramic where you took verticals and took four or five verticals and then stitched them together in post, you basically overlap those verticals together. It's kind of like that. You're, you're, it's shifting the pixels inside the camera over so that it can make a much larger, more detailed image. So, you know, the downfall or the downside of it is that you have to, your camera has to be absolutely rock solid. I mean, no wind, no movement. If there is any movement at all, it will ruin the shot. And where I see this being used is probably not a whole lot in nature. I think you would probably use it like as a studio camera, um, architecture camera where you're trying to get you know, these massive commercial shots uh, to put on billboards or, or just ultra detailed product shots, you know, things like that. So nice to have, but for a wildlife photographer or even a landscape photographer, it has limited uses. So like if, you're, if the trees are blowing in the distance, if you've got water running through your scene, that pixel shift isn't going to do you a whole lot of good. So I would just stay away from that. You've already got a 42 megapixel sensor. That's more than enough. So, uh, the shutter. The shutter is electronic and physical. It goes from 30 seconds to 1 8 thousandths of a second. Um, nothing really new to see there. I love the 8, 1 8 thousand top end shutter speed. Um, that's necessary in what I do because I do shoot fast moving birds like for example songbirds in flight and you have to have a really high shutter speed for them uh the iso is 100 to 32,000 expandable to 102,000 i did take this camera just out back briefly for some uh backyard bird photography just to give it an initial test uh, i thought that the iso was good i shot at 1000 had no real issues with the ISO. Probably a little bit more noise than my A7 III, but that's kind of to be expected with a large uh, sensor. However, I don't think it was really enough to worry about. It didn't bother me at all. And I've had cameras that bothered me greatly in that area. Um, very acceptable. Um, you can also use a lower ISO on this. You can go down to 50, but that's not a native ISO and it just does some fancy stuff behind the scenes to make it work. Uh, the metering modes, uh, typical metering modes, there's center weighted, uh, there's multi-zone and there's spot. And there's also a mode called highlight weighted. I've never used that mode. It sounds intriguing. I'll bet it doesn't work very well for what I do, but it does sound intriguing. Maybe I'll try it sometime. Um, I mostly use multi-zone and spot metering for what I do. Um, sometimes I use spot metering on a highlight to expose for the highlight, for example. But most of the time I'm in a multi-zone meter. Exposure modes, um, of course, aperture priority, shutter priority, manual and program for those that don't know aperture priority you have uh you set your aperture in there and then it picks the shutter speed right and you can turn on auto iso as well uh shutter priority is the exact opposite you pick the shutter and the camera picks the aperture manual in full control of everything you pick the shutter speed you pick the iso you pick the aperture that is the mode i use 99.9% .9 of the time and then there's program mode which is automatic i don't recommend it but it's a decent place to start for people continuous shooting now this is one of my big negatives with these with with the a7 III and the a7r3 sony likes to tell you that you get 10 frames per second and you do in high plus however the screen does not refresh properly at 10 frames per second. So you're not going to be shooting 
things that you need to shoot at 10 frames per second, like birds in flight, for example, uh, running deer, you know, any kind of running horses, running people, you're not going to be able to use it. So the reality is that this camera is really an eight frames per second camera. And let's hear what that sounds like real quick. More than enough. I, I think that uh, eight frames per second is fine. Um, I've used 10 frame per second cameras. I've used eight frame. I've used five frame. Eight frame is just right there in the middle. It's a good... It's good enough that you can catch the action, and it's not so much that you're filling up your cards rapidly. So I do recommend an 8 frame per second camera, especially for people that are just starting. It gives you a much lower shutter, uh, shutter count frames per second, and you can usually do better autofocus-wise. That's just my opinion. Take it or leave it. This camera um, came out before the a7 III, and so the a7 III has more features. Um, but in that respect, it also is only 10 frames per second, or 8 frames per second, because it has suffers from the same 10 frames per second problem. In the real world, I don't miss the 10 frames per second that my 7D Mark II had and my uh, 1D Mark II, or 1D Mark III, um, I mean, I, I don't miss it. Would I like to have it? Oh, yeah, of course, but I don't miss it. Um, it has, it can shoot 76 compressed raw at 8 frames per second. More more than easy. Uh, don't You don't run out of buffer with this camera very often. Uh, works very well. And that's 42 megapixels of 76 raw uh, before the buffer fills up. Um... So obviously the a7 III gets more than that. So the, the a7 III, because it's 24 megapixels, I want to say, don't quote me on this, but I want to say it's up around 80 in the 80s, maybe 86 or 85 frames per second before the buffer fills up, but don't quote me on that. But it is much higher than the a7R III. Uh, it has a self-timer mode, as you would expect, in two, se two seconds, five seconds, and 10 seconds. I like to use the five second myself because it guarantees that your camera has settled down before you take the shot. And it's there for doing things like landscape shots. Um, any, anything with a longer shutter speed, um, anything, anything really below a hundredth of a second, um, where you want ultra sharpness, even though you can get away with it, probably I would still use a, a a shutter release or a uh, or the five second timer it's 14 bit on the bit depth that's pretty standard for modern cameras nothing to see there video is 4k at 24 and 30p so you know would I like to see a hundred P on 4k absolutely uh, it is available on the HD in this camera. The HD is, uh, you know, 2430 and 100p, and so you can do some slow motion, which I do use on the a7 III. Uh, video is only up to 29 minutes in length. Um, that's a that's an ignorant thing to me. I can't stand that when they do that. However, these cameras do have a tendency to overheat especially in really hot conditions. I've seen them overheat in 15 minutes uh, in the in the hot southern sun here in North Carolina. And so I recommend having two cameras for video if you have 30, 30 minute. Um, so you can easily swap those bodies out. So what I will do is I'll primarily shoot with my a7 III until it gets too hot and shuts down. And then I'll just switch over to my a7R3 to finish the shoot. I don't foresee that happening with me a lot. I mostly do clips to sell, video clips. But there are times where I'm doing a video podcast, for example, that I might run over a half an hour in a clip. And so, you know, that's an issue. That bothers me. Especially considering that this was well over $3,000 when it was introduced. 
I feel like they could have done better with that. Memory card slots. Two slots. Awesome. Both the a7 III and this camera, a7R3, have two slots. However, there is a gotcha. Slot 2 is UHS-2. Slot 1 is UHS-1. And so, why they didn't make both UHS-2, I have no idea. I suppose... Maybe they were worried about compatibility and not enough people would have the brand new UHS 2s. Um, I think at the time, Sony was the only one making them. Um, so it, that maybe was part of the issue. Maybe it was cost savings. Maybe it was bus speed kind of thing with the camera itself. I really don't know. Uh, but it is annoying. It has a video output. So you can output to micro HDMI. Not a fan of micro HDMI. Um, the my other camera, the A7 III, has a larger uh, HDMI out. Audio it has headphone and microphone, 3.5 millimeter jacks. You can also attach microphones to the hot shoe. It does have Wi-Fi. It does have Bluetooth. Now it has no GPS. Is that a deal breaker? Not really. I mean, I have it on my a7 III. If you do want to use GPS with this camera, you can um, pair your phone with it, and it will use the phone's GPS to stamp the images. So that is a possibility. The viewfinder. The viewfinder is 3,686,400 dots. That is a big improvement over the a7 III, which has a much lower uh, resolution. So the reality is, is why is that important? Well, when you're doing um, manual focus and you want to zoom into manual focus, you get a much better pixel uh, dot, dots per inch, and that allows you to really fine-tune that focus. Um, of course, you have focus peaking in this camera, another beautiful thing about mirrorless cameras. If you don't know what focus peaking is, when you manually focus, actually little, a little pattern of red or yellow, whatever you select, or white, shows up around the outside of the, the edges, the high contrast areas of your image. And it allows you, when they, come, when they turn red, that means it's in focus. And so you don't have to rely on just your eyeball anymore to really scrutinize the image. And I really love that. I actually first started using that in video production um, on, on Panasonic cameras that had that feature. So it's kind of spread across all of the, the different cameras uh, at this point. It does have zebras. I love zebras. What zebras are is a setting in your camera where if the image is overexposed, you will see these black and white lines that kind of move on your screen showing you you know, a highlight warning that you've overexposed. Similar to Canon, where you had the flash, the bright flashing, uh, I guess, viewfinder. The in, in the viewfinder, it, it would flash brightly. Not in the viewfinder; it was on the back of the camera that you'd see it on the old DSLRs. I'm not sure what Canon's doing now. I can't remember when I when I reviewed the EOS R a while back. I can't remember what. Uh, what it has i'm sure it probably has zebras but i can't honestly remember um you know you can you can correct me on that so the battery is the npfz 100 not the older battery this is the new battery that gets an amazing battery life i can shoot all day long without any issues whatsoever i don't have any problems um and then when you add the two batteries together in the grip it's it's just I mean, you don't lose any battery life hardly at all. And I'm talking about shooting. I've I've shot with the A7 III, for example, down in Florida, and I've literally photographed, you know, four or five hours straight of just nonstop action shooting, and the battery was fine. So the flash sync on this camera is one two fiftieth. I would love to have seen one three twentieth. Um, 1250 is good though. Um, why would you want a higher flash sync speed? The reason for that 
is that when you are photographing using a traditional flash that's not TTL and you're doing a multi-flash setup, in our world, where we're photographing, say, hummingbirds, for example, you don't want any ambient light to creep into your photograph. And so the higher that shutter speed is, the less chance that's going to happen. 1 250th is good. Again, I would love to see that at 1 320. I think it would really kind of nip it in the bud. But, um, you know, the way you solve that problem is you find somewhere darker to take the shot or you start looking into multi-flash TTL. And that's the other more expensive way to do that. I, I think we'll do a, once I get my Sony flashes all together, that's another thing I need to purchase. Once I get those all together, I think we'll maybe do a, a podcast episode on, on the flashes for Sony uh, and what they do and how to set them up. You know, obviously you're going to hear a lot more from me on the Sony products since I'm ship since I'm switching to that. However, I'll also be doing my typical um how to videos, how to reviews of other products, how to, you know, do wildlife photography, how to do, you know, bird photography, how to do birds in flight. You'll see all that stuff that I'll still continue to do. As a matter of fact, I need to refresh a lot of those old uh, episodes because, you know, the technology has changed so much and some of the, and with some of that kind of stuff that I feel like I need to, you know, do some some modernization so you may see some of that coming out um, I did want to get on on this a7r3 first impressions though I wanted to get that out as quickly as I could just because I feel like I'm kind of in that series right now kind of explaining you know why I'm upgrading and all that kind of thing um, be looking for some videos coming out not sure when I still got to you know formulate this in my mind but be looking for some videos about about the settings that I use for my birds in flight, uh, what I use for my landscape photographs, and what I use for my video. And so you're going to start seeing some of that coming out, just probably just on the YouTube channel. Although I may release it here as well, just to give you something to listen to. I, I don't know how beneficial it will be without being able to see the back of the camera, but you may I may put that out here. I don't know. Um. Anyway, uh, you know, I'm still in the process of testing this new camera. It will it will take a year or two to fully test it and to fully flesh out all the issues. Uh, it will take me a while to to um, to find some good birds and flight opportunities to use with this camera, and so um, be looking for that. I am I am going to try to head out tomorrow and. See if I can locate our local bald eagle. He's or she. Uh, I saw her uh, about a mile from our house about a week or two ago, and she was actually on the side of the road eating some roadkill. And, of course, she flew when I came near her, but I know where her nest is, and I'll probably walk down there and see what's going on tomorrow. And maybe we'll get an opportunity to see some birds in flight uh, with the A7R3. But anyway, that's really all I had for today. Um, you know, drop me a line if you if you want to if you have more questions about the A7R3. I will be doing a more exhaustive uh, review of this of this somewhat older but still relevant camera. And um, anyway, thanks for listening. Make it a great day, and get out there and enjoy nature. Bye bye. <laughs>